Dr. Bayati, thank you very much uh, for spending the time with us. Um, you were born in Iran. Yes. And uh, you were born in Isfahan, yes. I imagine. Um, and you went to high school there. Okay. Which high school did you go there? Uh, I think Shahid Ajayi. You think? Okay. <laughs> This is one of I those. I don't know if it's changed the name, but okay. This is one of those T. Sushan, one of those smart kids' school, right? Y uh, yes. Yes. But I mean, I don't think there is much difference. But yes. <laughs> okay, you, you're 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 very humble, and we appreciate that. Um, a part of the activities that you did over there led you to uh, participate in the Olympiads. That's correct. And what happened over there? Uh, so we. You know, we, we, we got to hang out with Dr. Tabesh, yeah, and, and that was the best that's part. That's how I know, yes. yes. <laughs> and the rest is, you know, we got to uh, work on problem solving. What did you achieve in the Olympiads? Uh, our team did a good job that year. We got four gold and two silver. So that was the first year after many years. Like I, th I think our rank was three. That was the best rank we got. After us, some other teams won first rank, too. So it was fun. And you were one of those people who got gold. Yes. And how did that shape your future after that? How participating in Olympia shape your, your thinking about what you want to do in the future? That was Olympia of math, right? Yes. OK, so that, that probably made you to go into the math, right? Yes, it did have that. I would say that was one impact that, uh, I, you know, I I really liked m solving math problems, and I decided to pursue that for academic uh, career. Uh, but I think the best part of it really was like the network of people that I got to know, uh, and like all day we could call like Olympia de folks, and you know as well as our mentors. <laughs> so that was really the best part. Excellent. Um, you went to Sharif. Yes. So. It's only fair to ask you the ranking of your concours. So that the one of the blessings of the first piece was I didn't get to, you know. You didn't have to go through I a concours when go through. you got the gold in yes. medal. So yeah, we escaped the high school. And I remember, like, so we would have to take the uh, diploma. But we still had to do that. Like, yes. You know? Yes, so you have to finish to high school, but you didn't have yeah, to do so, the So you should ask any Olympiad, like, what was your concours GPA? Like, your diploma GPA, right? Okay, so what was your uh, diploma GPA? I don't GPA? know, like, something like <laughs> tw 12, 13, like, something pretty low, because we would have you to You lead study. us to a place and you do duck. Okay, exactly. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, after your BS, you came to Stanford. Yes. And what did you do at Stanford? So I came here, continued the math, you know, journey. Uh, decided, like, entered the math department here uh, to do my PhD. And, uh, you know, you come to Stanford to do math, and then all the other Iranians are in the double D department. Yes. And so I read all the gatherings. They talk about what they do, and then there's no way I can even explain what I'm working on. So Was that intimidating, or was the silo that you had around what you did comforting? It was both. It was uh, so at some point, I realized, you know what? I don't have to continue this. <laughs> they also are working on math problems. It was math. It was just different math. So I decided to transfer to electrical engineering. Oh, you did? Okay. I did, even though you know I'm I, I finished my degree in double E, but I didn't. I mean, still, I don't know a lot of double E, electrical engineering. Uh, but it was the math part of it that I continued. It intrigued you. So you got your double PhD from Stanford working with who? Uh, with uh, two professors. One of them was actually here a few months ago, Amin Saberi. He was mm -hmm. one of my co-advisors. Yeah. And yeah. the other one was uh, Professor Prabhakar, Balaji Prabhakar. And what did you work on for your PhD thesis, for S PhD work? So my PhD thesis was pretty much mathy, uh, I would say. Uh, I was uh, trying to generate, like that was the time of, you know, like social networks and Facebook uh, emerging. So we were trying to generate uh, network data mm -hmm. uh, that look realistic, but we were able to generate many of them so we can sample uh, and just analyze data uh, related to networks. So I, I mean, the for formally, like we would generate, we had to generate random graphs with given degrees. And this is an, what we call an NP-hard problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, that 
gave me a PhD. <laughs> so you, you created your own sample problems. Is this working? Yeah. You created your own sample problems by r creating random graphs and then you... So we would generate random instances of Facebook, but thousands of it, and then you would yeah. get to, now you basically create data. So right, then, right. But, because but there's random only data. one Facebook, right? So if you want to see a phenomenon in Facebook happen by chance, or it's actually like something else to it, so you would have to create versions of Facebook and then see does that fa same phenomenon happen in the other uh, versions or not. Uh, and that wasn't your last pivot. You again pivoted and you went, and you right now you are not in a math department or no. the double E department. You're yes. a professor in? Right. So. Uh, I went to Microsoft after PhD. Mm -hmm. They had a research lab, and it was pretty much a theory group. Like all, like still, everybody was working on math. And at that time, I thought of you know, let's just do something more applied, just to test it, uh, you know, how how that is. And uh, that was when I entered, like, I tried to learn about machine learning. It was around 2007, 2008. It was pretty exciting time. Like I remember. There was this like Netflix competition those days, for a lot of uh, folks in academia to like you know to predict users' uh, interest in movies, and then inside Microsoft there was another version internally, mm -hmm. uh, and for a different question, and that's that got us excited, and we, we looked at that problem, and I, I, that was a, my first experience of encountering machine learning, and I realized. Uh, first, we thought, like it was a group of four of us, all of us math people without any background in machine learning and statistics, and we thought this is going to be easy. We spent a month, and then we were beaten badly. But then that, that was the time that I realized, Wh oh, What do you mean you were beaten badly? What internally happened? in the Microsoft. Oh, I see. Okay. I see. There were other teams who Other did teams yes. that did okay. a lot better, and that was the time that we realized I mean, I actually realized this thing can be hard, and it's actually, the math behind it is pretty interesting. So that was the pivot. So I decided to continue theory of um, high dimensional statistics and machine learning. But then the another th interesting thing that did happen was, uh, this is actually like, by current standards, like it was like the best thing that happened those days. Like suddenly I got access to f seven hospitals data sets, which is something that you, like right now, it's very hard to get because real of all the data privacy, now. real not, data. Not randomly generated. Exactly, gaps, yes. real data. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason was Microsoft wanted to enter the healthcare space and they bought a startup in DC that was managing seven hospitals data. So suddenly you have access to that and we say, okay, I wanna learn machine learning. This looks interesting. Let's apply machine learning to healthcare. And that seemed like a very fun and in, uh, let's just say intellectually rewarding uh, Area and yeah. I pretty much continued afterwards that domain, which is um, you know machine learning algorithms, their theoretical analysis and application in the healthcare, and that led me to the business school as well. Because so how did the, that that lead you to business school? What what made you say I don't want to work in the industry, I want to go and teach? So at Microsoft Research, uh, you know it's almost like a university. Microsoft Research, mm -hmm. uh, you just don't teach, uh, but you know, at the same time, it is not like academia. At the end of the day, I in academia, you really have the freedom of what problem to work on. So I, I kind of missed that part. I, not to the sense that, I, I mean, we had a quite a bit of freedom, I must say. But uh, I just, like for a long career, I knew that, you know, I would have to be restricting myself. So I decided to come back to Stanford, do another postdoc. Uh, to also learn more about the statistics part, because Stanford has actually, like I would say, number one a stat department in the world, and I, I was regretting that I didn't take a single class when I was doing my PhD in stats. <laughs> in stats. Yeah. So I came back and I was working with someone in the stat uh, in Double E, and that was uh, during that time I realized the healthcare, applied healthcare research that I'm doing, is also of interest to folks in the business school. So that's how I transitioned to the business did school. Did you approach them or did they ask I approached them. I mean, you, you, when you apply for academic jobs, you just send applications all over the place. So. And I how long have you been teaching at Stanford Business School? Uh, about 14, 13 years now. 13 years? Oh, okay. So you're a veteran over there. Not, I mean, we have folks who are there for 40 years, but yes. <laughs> Uh, do you think you will pivot again and start a company and go out of Stanford, or do you think you're going to become emeritus over there? Uh, it's it's a 
I, I mean, I don't think there will be like a, I mean, it's hard to predict. There are academicians who leave especially their job, the future, yeah. especially the future. And you know, the biggest, this AI that you talked about, that's a big disruption to half of my life, which is teaching. You know, it, we have a very difficult time like, really uh, realizing what to teach, how to teach. So, uh, you know, you never know, maybe two years from now, I would have to look for another job, so. Because, <laughs> because teaching is gonna be AI taken over teach by you. <laughs> Everybody will have a teacher uh, in, in their pocket. I mean, pocket, it, yeah. that's an area that, you know, is ripe for innovation, but uh, overall, you never know. You cannot predict the future, but, uh, but to answer your question, I, I, it's, it's a intellectually rewarding kind of experience. What, what things that can change in, a, in like someone's life, like in academia, is like the research areas that you focus on may just pivot sometimes dramatically. And again, AI uh, is uh, creating new areas of research and that could be causing a new change. And sometimes you really need to move to industry to collaborate with industry just to get to know real questions. Uh, something that I do like actually like with uh, Amazon. I, I do some work yeah. with Amazon yes yeah. uh, they say there are two big things that is going to happen with AI it's going to be a teacher in your pocket and it's going to be a doctor in your pocket and you, you're m working more in the area of the doctors in your pocket healthcare and AI what is your precognition I what can tell you the other half I you do a lot too but I, I'm a user you're, you're a, you, oh, of yeah. We are all users. We are all users. Yes. <laughs> okay, so in the area of healthcare and AI, what are we in store to see as far as your crystal ball, which is a lot shinier and clearer than mine, can tell? What should we expe expect? It's, you know, I would still, <laughs> it's a very hard question to answer because of the following. The healthcare space, there are problems. Uh, but turning them, turning like solving them is not is not a technological challenge. It's not like we couldn't solve these uh, with the let's just say ten years ago AI. Like the problems that exist, a lot of them are business model problems or organizational challenges, incentives. So some of those haven't changed. So we will give us an example. So the example, like you know, many hospitals in the U.S. are paid for what they do. We call fee for service. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to a doctor, they do two procedures, they get paid for two procedure. So if they do three, they get paid more. So now, if you go to a hospital that is on that system, and you tell them, "Hey, I have a, I want to use AI to make you more efficient to save." They're like, why would I want to save? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, they never tell you that, but I'm just trying. The incentive, the incentive is not is there, hundred yes. percent. Now there is like we have, we call value-based delivery, which is slowly picking up. Which is we pay you based on how much you improve a patient's care. So those changes are required to really see massive changes in the healthcare and AI. Uh, but there are areas that you could see big changes, like for example. At Amazon, I was working with their pharmacy group. You know, you have a for-profit entity, and that uh, they have all the incentives to mm -hmm. use AI and to deliver better care. Or, you know, Kaiser is another example. You know, it's a comp it's a hospital or healthcare provider, but they're also an insurance company. They pay for it themselves, so you, they are they're innovating a lot in the healthcare area. So we see some areas that there could be big innovations, but those fundamental business model and incentive challenges haven't really changed. And before they change, uh, it's no. going to be a lot of slower than other industries. Uh, I've heard in some places in China, doctors get paid for the number of days their patients are well. So as soon as somebody gets sick, they stop paying their doctors. Do you think this kind of incentive has a way to get programmed, coded into our systems over here? Th that is this value-based delivery, that they are being coding, like Obamacare started introducing it, but it's very slowly being adopted. So it is, it's a very slow, a small incentives, I would say. Okay, your focus area is healthcare and AI, cancer prediction and AI alignment. So what is AI alignment? Can you explain that to us? So, I mean, from high level, it's just when AI is just doing something that you don't expect from its purpose. So from in the healthcare space, uh, if you have an AI assistant for a clinician, um, 
if it makes a mistake, you can call it misaligned. But uh, there isn't this problem. Who is the judge to say that maybe that, that mistake is actually a better logic? That's actually that. The point you just read is one of the fundamental questions that any time this discussion comes up, which is like sometimes we tell, uh, like for example, they would say, oh, what if AI is right, the doctor was wrong? Yeah. How would you be able to tell? But there are some things that are very much, Obvious. very solid, evi very solid knowledge, medical knowledge that has been validated. And when you train an AI on data, it, it surprisingly, it does well on all the benchmarks, but then it makes very silly mistakes regarding to that solid knowledge. Hallucination. Hallucination is a perfect one, yeah. So this interpretability or explainability of the, the decisions that, data, uh, that, that AI makes, it's still a black art. Yes. Are, are, are we making inroads in that? Because you know you, you have to solve that problem before people can let go and let machines take over. I would. I used to think that way, but I started th changing my way of thinking about it. Maybe it's wrong, but uh, in a sense that yes, there is actually there is a lot of good research done on interpretable AI, like you know how, how this AI makes better decision. By AI, I mean like machine learning algorithms, but. Uh, it has been much slower, uh, the adoption of those techniques, compared to the way AI just being advancing at a rapid pace and uh, rapid pace and better versions of it coming out. So, the, so another way to think about it is, what if it's a black box? There is no way for us to understand how the box works, but you, what you get to operate with is the input and output of this box. Uh, if you can, and that's how actually the, one of the leaps in this AI alignment happened, as everybody now probably knows, like this RLHF approach was, it was, they didn't try to understand how the GPT-3 working. All they did were just like, let's just give it output examples and then, or look at these output examples and just tell it this is a good one, that's a bad one, like use the feedback mechanism. So Reinforce training essentially. Right, so the way, that now, you, you point about like what makes people let go. You know, it's all about you know if people trust that this uh, input and output system works in a reliable fashion. I think that's all it takes for adoption. A lot of people are now using ChatGPT into their workflow, even though it hallucinates, right? Because they have realized for certain tasks they can uh, still take the output, edit it, and then use it. Uh, so I think it's all about like. Uh, people are trusting the input and out t the output of the system. Uh, so, so for if I am doing a report or a slide set, it's all, you know, it's it's all practical for me to detect. Well, well, this part is hallucinating that, and this part I can I can modify myself. But models that can accurately predict cancer outcomes and progressions given the complexity and heterogeneity of the disease across different patients and tumor types these are not things that you know we can say well well maybe a machine made a mistake in those we have to have a reliable way of uh, i don't know having an alternate way to check that yes how can we do that is there a parallel system that we need to develop or do we need to uh, or, or are we hoping that the system that we're designing eventually converge to a non-hallucinating thing? Uh, so it's all about, uh, so there are different ways to answer this. One way is, you know, it's an assistant provides information to the doctor. Doctor is the ultimate decision maker. Like mm -hmm. that's kind of a cliche response that you get to hear a lot of times from. Uh, and it, I mean, some clinicians are happy with that. But the kind of a, with more generative AI, one approach that has been working in some areas and in the healthcare space, I think that would be a promising one, is to combine it with the solid knowledge that we talked about. You know, if you are using it for cancer prediction, you can inject, uh, so you can actually ask, like this is a lot of folks probably know, like you know, you ask an AI three questions, let's just say, and you know the answer to two of them. If it correctly answers the two, then you would trust the third questions answered a lot more, right? So it's kind of a uh, uh, interesting way of thinking about it. This is like the consistency approach that is applied in generative AI. So now you can use the existing clinical knowledge uh, 
to validate that. To, without you know, telling the AI that I have that knowledge, to validate the rest of it. That's, that's been something that has proven to be successful in this, some of the incremental uh, advances that we've seen. Before I open it for people coming from the audience, could you tell us what areas do you think are ripe for people or are interesting for people to get into in order to uh, ride the wave of AI and medicine or AI and healthcare in the near future? What should they study? What should they do? Um, hard question. Uh, <laughs> on one hand, I think it's good to get to know a little bit more about how these systems work. You know, it's very hard to really open the box, but it's good to understand a little bit what is the deep learn what is deep learning algorithm, uh, and how are these trained just a little bit. But the more important part is it, this is a rapidly moving space, uh, so it's staying current on the latest development is, I think, right now is an important time to be, but. Uh, but being more agile because things change. You know, a month ago, Claude 3 was the best model. Now, this new chat GPT 4.0 came out. You know, things just change very quickly. Uh, so, what's the right stable uh, setting? Uh, although the good news is that switching costs are pretty low. You know, you're the same code, you just apply it to different models. Like, there's just small API uh, updates, but the rest of the code is the same. But kind of, other than staying current and understanding how the system will work, I think really the most important part is to uh, think about questions rather than the tech. Uh, the biggest mistake a lot of times happens when a new technology comes in is like technology enthusiasts or tech experts like want to solve every problem with that. R I think solution looking for a problem. Exactly yeah. right. It's like fall not one shouldn't fall in love with the tech and fall mm -hmm. in love with the problem. You know, sometimes like you want to see what questions, what business questions you want to address, and uh, you know, at this point, folks can try to do an assessment. You know, which area seems to be ripe. You know, everybody talks about healthcare. Okay, so now that's one step. Now, I want to work on healthcare, but then let's just see what is the hard question. Uh, that seems to be amenable. But then at that point, I would just try to focus on the problem more. And then from there, I would pick up the technology needed to solve that problem. I don't need to know the rest of the AI. So it's like being problem focused rather than, it's like a, Very wise. It, this is nothing new. This is like a, right. uh, and then the other piece would be uh, in healthcare, specific to healthcare. What I learned is that the, the AI solutions it's very different than, you have to closely work with the user. User, who is the user? It's a clinician. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult you know, for me to be like a company. I say, I build a product, I go, let's just, let's just do customer validation, like that's too late. I have to have the, the traditional customer, way of the traditional yeah, yeah. way is different. Like I have to have the customer validation, like as I am building it, like in a very continuous fashion. So where where this is possible, like I gave you an example of Amazon. Like I was working with pharmacists that are part of Amazon, so I get to like you know it's like the same team. You're under the same roof. And it's important because the incentives are aligned. So the same way, you know, if, if you pick a telemedicine company, you know, maybe go work with them or. So rather than trying to build something and then go sell it out to clinicians, I think that's a lot harder. That, that's one thing that I learned. Very good. I have a lot more questions, but I would like to give, uh, to give a chance for people in the audience to ask questions. So I already see four hands raised. Uh, John, can we start with this gentleman over here in yellow short sleeve? And again, please state your name and your affiliation before asking your Questions? Uh, yes, uh, thanks for attending and your speech. I'm uh, Mahmoud Lahroudi, a new entrepreneur in digital twins industry. My question is about uh, mathematical complexity of uh, AI models. As a mathematician, uh, could you explain uh, how difficult it is to uh, understand AI models, especially when we consider that as a high dimensional uh, space? The short answer I can give is our understanding is very minimal compared to <laughs> the, the state of these models. Uh, so there is a large community of theory of deep learning, theory of machine learning that is working to understand uh, 
but we understand very limited. Things that we know is that uh, what this called over parametrization is very important. Like it allows you to, like at least there's, in some very stylized settings, it has been shown that by making these, the number of parameters, like a lot of people will say, well, duh, that's obvious, but now mathematicians can actually prove that by increasing the number of parameters, you can learn more complex functions. But then at the same time, you also, I would say the surprise, more surprising part is that the, the size of the data actually is important. Like more data, more samples allow you to learn more complex uh, patterns. This wasn't the case with the underparameterized settings. You know, as long as you had your data passed a certain limit, you would be done in terms of like learning the. Uh, but at the end of the day, like this is just things that people have observed ten years ago. Like that, now mathematicians can say something about. Thank you, General over there. Hello. Um, thank you for um, coming. Uh, my name is Diego, and I was an ex software engineer at Amazon. Um, and my question is, um, I'd like to push a little bit on, on Say's last question, which is, um, um, I, I understand that it's a very good idea to start on a problem and build a product based on that. But um, for someone who um, do, do not have the opportunity to do startups right now, um, and I want to keep learning on um, AI, and AI and possibly work for AI and um, practice my AI skills, so what good advice do you have? Um, do you think I should, uh, what areas should I focus on? And should I um, go on Gen AI? And um, um, in maybe in five years, um, maybe I can pivot to um, startup, uh, startups. Um, what advice do you have? Um, so I think going back to the first part, I mean, the best learning is learned by doing, and it kind of limits and allows you to focus. So I would say still try to pick a project <laughs> any, in any form and try to so work towards solving that project and pick up what you need to learn along the way for that. Uh, but in terms of, uh, I think the AI alignment as a researcher, I find it exciting because I think it's very hard. We are far from solving it. So there are startups work on this space. Big companies are working on this space. So that's an interesting area. Uh, like hallucinations of these AI models is the same as you know AI, part of the AI alignment. So solving those problems, I think for, for a long period of time, we're gonna have to <laughs> have answers for those. I don't think they're gonna be solved overnight. Hello, um, thank you so much for the great speech. Um, my name is Marco Musgar from March Health. We are working on non-invasive diagnosis of endometriosis. I have a specific question regarding the um, value-based care model that you talked earlier. How AI, um, machine learning, uh, da data science can be leveraged to improve the quality of uh, implementation and outcome of different um, value-based care models in healthcare. So value-based healthcare, one hard, the hard one hard part there is to measure uh, how much you improve the care of the patient. You know, when the patient arrived, how sick they were, measuring how sick they were, and then how much we improved their health. So this concept of risk adjustment, as they call it. So. Uh, AI can help you make that measurement more accurately, like adjusting the risk. And generative AI, I think one big benefit, especially in healthcare, is that it requires less data than kind of the traditional model. So, and healthcare is a space where it's very hard to get data or it, very hard to have data in certain like a specialties. The moment you put three filters, like you only get 20 patients in a hospital, right? So then Gen AI can, Allow, solve those problems still because it sometimes needs few samples for certain problems, not every problem, of course. So that's another. Uh, and the last question goes to the lady in black over there. Hi, um, my name is Lala. I'm a clinical associate professor at UCLA. I'm a critical care physician. Um, I wanted to congratulate you on your nature medicine paper published a few weeks ago where you used a language model for Amazon uh, online pharmacy uh, operations. I think as a clinician, it's probably the most obvious application of 
language models is improving quality and safety. Um, my question for you is do you think uh, it could have been done with an outside company or do you feel when you're applying generative AI for operations it must be internally grown? Very good question. I think, I, you know, I, I found the first route a lot easier, but I mean, that cannot be the only way. So actually one has to figure out, we have to innovate what are best ways of doing the latter. Like BCG, uh, there was an article that BCG expects next year 20% of their revenue comes from helping companies incorporate AI into their existing workflows. Like, I, to, if you ask me, like, why would it be BCG, right? This is... Uh, there should be better, like I would say, like more uh, startups like helping them. So find it's it's something that has, I think it's a pain itself. So that means it's an opportunity for innovation. Finding out how we can help non AI companies, uh, like non AI born companies, integrate a AI into their workflow. So I'm I'm really not answering your question. I'm just saying uh, this is a problem that needs to be solved. So I would go after the former route as much as possible if needed, which is homegrown approach. The bar is a lot lower, you know, like to build the first version of a product, you really don't need a lot of technical expertise. But one big change that has happened is building an AI product is quite easy, but fine tuning it, fixing the bugs, the bugs are not bugs like these are hallucinations, that requires more effort after the deployment. So that for that part, maybe you would need like kind of the external help. But if you're willing, like in low risk areas, pick a low risk area, internally build a product, and then depending on how it, like where you need to fine tune it, then bring the external help. That would be one way. Thank you very much, Professor Mohsen Bayati. Uh, they, our speakers would be available after this session for a few minutes for, uh, for you to ask further of questions. And before you go, I am tasked to encourage everyone to attend uh, Homoyun Shajarian's concert this Sunday. Don't ask me why. Uh, Rahim uh, is a big fan of Homoyun, and he wants you all to be there. Uh, but on behalf of the Amidi group, the Iranian community, the Persian Tech Network, and Plug and Play, I would like to thank you for spending the time with us and answering our questions. Thank, thank you. you for having us.